So for those of you who were able to join us last week, thank you so much and welcome back. And for those of you for whom this is your first session, welcome. We are so pleased to present Professor Merida Pam Jensen as she speaks about on education. Thank you very much, Kim. And thank you for all that you do and for organizing uh, our gathering. Um, it's a pleasure <laughs> to be back. Today, uh, since we are going to take up one chapter or book of the Emil per session, we will be talking about book two. And uh, if you are reading along, um, also if you have some questions or comments you'd like to ask me directly after our session is over, please feel free to email me. Um, I wanted to say something before we actually get into, well, it's part of getting into book two, I think, uh, to consider briefly the illustrations uh, that Rousseau designed for the Emile. Um, the illustration for book one, and which he presents as the frontispiece for the entire work, is the picture from the Iliad of Thetis. Uh, dipping her little son Achilles, bouncing baby boy, into the river Styx in order to make him invulnerable. And <clears throat> of course, it doesn't work um, because she has to hold him by the heel. And so there is a vulnerability um, that he has. Uh, and the Illustration for book two is an illustration also pertinent to Achilles. Uh, it shows the, cent the centaur Chiron, perhaps one of the only kind centaurs there were, supposedly, uh, kind to human beings. He taught medicine to Asclepius, and he also taught medicine to Achilles. But the illustration that Rousseau glosses for book two is Chiron teaching the young Achilles, who was known to be very fleet of foot, teaching young Achilles how to run. And that is, of course, very important in book two. Because Achilles is mentioned, um, maybe one thing we could say just on the, just by way of uh, a little bit of context is that this education doesn't work. It doesn't work for Achilles. And so it leads one to ask the question, does the education perhaps not work for Emil? Is that something that Rousseau is perhaps trying to communicate that as much as you try, um, it's just, you know, even though you can control so many things and uh, the tutor is, in a way, the godlike figure uh, of, the, of the work, in spite of everything that is done, um, that, again, is he signaling that the education doesn't work? Another way to think about it, and this I'll just leave up to you for the moment, is, or maybe forever, <laughs> is that, um, Although Rousseau says you shouldn't have even tried to make Achilles invulnerable because it takes away the virtue of courage and anybody could be an Achilles if it were, you know, if it were that simple. Um, but also uh, it, it may be, or one other possibility is that Rousseau as tutor or Rousseau the writer designs the education of Emile so that he does have an Achilles heel, so that he does have a vulnerability and that that vulnerability is part of what it would mean to be successful in this enterprise. And so that is something perhaps also to keep in mind. Um, in each of Rousseau's works, there is also, in addition to an illustration, uh, a, dis a an epigraph, a little writing like you might put at the head of a paper that you are writing. And in this case, that little writing uh, comes from the Roman philosopher, ancient Roman philosopher Seneca, 
from an essay called On Anger. So that makes our ears prick up because we're thinking about what does this have to do with anger? In almost any translation that you would get um, of the Iliad, the story of Achilles, um, you're going to find something like, I sing the wrath of Achilles, or let the goddess sing the anger of Peleus' son, Achilles. So anger and Achilles also go together, uh, not just running. And um, it raises the question whether Rousseau's version of Achilles is going to be able to um, deal with or eradicate uh, anger. And that is something also that we can track as we go through. Um, I think that maybe the subtitle of book two might be become as a little child, uh, as the gospel says, because um, Rousseau insists that parents and tutors or governors have no idea how children think. And consequently, they waste their time and they even can corrupt the soul on the basis of the fact that they, that they do not really take their bearings at the level of the child. They don't study the child. Childhood of the species as well as childhood uh, of any given individual. Oh, and I, I forgot to say one thing. The centaur who is the tutor of Achilles is half man and half beast. And as you probably know, Machiavelli notices that as well and says it was the ancient's secret way of teaching that if you want to be successful in politics, you can't simply be human, you have to be half man and half beast. Or rather, as he gradually slips in or, or suddenly slips in, you have to be two beasts, the fox and the lion. I don't know if that's what Rousseau has in mind, but I will say this, a centaur, half man, half horse, um, is a mythical creature. And a centaur, I mean, something of a monster, a, chim a, chim a chimera, something of a monster. And if we were to think of Rousseau as the tutor or playing the role of the tutor, um, that's also maybe something to keep in mind. So the subtitle uh, is Become as a Little Child. And if we survey the terrain of book two, we can see that it mirrors the age of the child. Book two is very long. It covers a long period from about age three to almost age 12. And when it ends, it presents us with uh, a being whom Rousseau calls, full of praise, the mature child, the person who has the perfection of his age. It's a very image rich uh, chapter. It's different in tone from book one. Uh, and in that sense, it also mirrors the age of the child. At the end of book two, Rousseau adds, or he um, writes a little survey, a little review. Let's see where we are now and how far we have come. He surveys his work and he sees that it is good. He uh, admires what Emil has become based on the book of nature and not on any books by scholars. Um, he has limited ideas, but they are clear and distinct in the manner in which Descartes says our minds should have them. And he, is not going to be guilty of a servile submission to authority, nor is he going to be imperious the way some masters or teachers are, or politicians are. He is the kind of natural leader. Um, and in that sense, it reminds us, I think, as well, that although 
a meal is about education, the education of an individual. Judging by the title of books, which we ought not to do, he says, we might say that in an inverse of Plato's Republic, that there are political implications to the things that Rousseau is saying in book two. Um, and when we see um, what is essentially the spectacle of natural freedom, this is what it looks like. Um, this is this is what is so desirable about natural freedom. When Rousseau speaks that way, when he talks about the fact that our first duties are to ourselves, when he talks about our rights, he is talking about things that seem to have um, important political implications and not just to be the games of children. In other words, it would be wrong to walk away from this saying, of course, this is how a child can behave. But when you are grown up, you do have to obey. There are people who command. There are punishments. There are things that do not appear in the education itself. And so there's a way in which Rousseau can talk about things that have an importance for our adult years uh, in the process of talking about talking um, in the guise of the representation of the natural freedom. And um, as I said, I think when we survey the terrain of book two, we see how it mirrors the children's, the child's age. What we see is essentially unfettered joy, frolics, running, jumping, high-spirited and happy games. Uh, and in that sense, even though Rousseau does mention, of course, that we always have to learn how to endure suffering, and there is perhaps always more suffering than joy in life, we have to learn how to bear the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. Nevertheless, in this depiction of innocence and idleness and gaiety, um, in which we are taught not by other human beings, but by things, and in which the child is encouraged to imitate the cat when a cat goes into a room and explores everything so that the early education of a child is a kind of study in experimental physics, not by reading books, um, not by studying uh, signs or cardboard globes, but just on the basis of um, the way in which the child is allowed to play, encouraged to play. The child believes always that he is the master of the exercises. In fact, the tutor is the master. The child never sees an intention to instruct him, all the better. Uh, the child um, always believes that uh, he is free, when in fact, of course, as I mentioned last time, Rousseau mentions in book two on page 120 of the Bloom edition that there is no subjection so perfect as that which retains the appearance of freedom. So the whole point, given the high-spirited joy in which a child lives in this age, the whole point would be to make sure that these years, these seven or eight years are not a sad and sterile time, that they are not used to torment the child by giving him speculative studies and words that he can memorize, but not at all understand. Again, the child does know how to reason, um, but only about certain kinds of things. Some of these studies, for example, learning two languages or um, learning heraldry or geography or even history are designed so that the tutor can show off his um, expertise, his learning, and so that the father will continue to want to pay for the child's education as a consequence of the fact that his little one is looking like a prodigy <laughs> and um, there are very few prodigies, even though we all think uh, we have one at one time. 
or another. And Rousseau has a very beautiful phrase for this. He says, um, the child talks all the time and consequently they're bound to have a few bon mots uh, in their conversation. But really for most children, it's like they are, they are like an eaglet who for an instant cleaves the air um, and then falls back into his airy. It's a very beautiful notion of how um, children can charm by the things that they say, but that we shouldn't believe for all of that, that each one of them is going to be an Albert Einstein. I mean, Rousseau wouldn't care about that. So um, parallel to Plato's Republic, the content of the education is in gymnastic and music. Uh, gymnastic are the exercises of the body and music, which encompasses all of the arts and sciences, seem are directed to the soul. But as uh, Socrates says in the Republic, in fact, the gymnastic education of the guardians um, who, with whom they are concerned in the Republic are really designed for the soul or for the mind. And Rousseau would underline that and even say gymnastics uh, as he wants them practiced actually develop the soul because the first faculties we have are our senses, our feet, our hands, our eyes, our organs, eyes, ears, touch, the organs of touch, even the organs of taste. We have to be taught to see, to hear, to touch. And the education of Emil at this point, um, the, the first education that we should have is designed to train our senses, to teach us how to see and how to hear. And to do that, um, again, without ever bringing in maxims, sermons, books, uh, poetry, anything of the sort. I mean, in a sense, you might think of playground equipment. It teaches you how to move but it also teaches you how to judge things. And if you judge incorrectly, you could fall or a climbing wall. I mean, that is something which stretches the judgment as much as the muscles and the legs. And um, I again, I think that's very important to say. I mean, there is something of a very modern, to use modern in the sense of beginning with Machiavelli, Hobbes, and Locke, a uh, way of looking at the development of the human heart or development of the soul. It is not something which necessarily pre-exists. All of our organs must be, and our faculties have to be employed, have to be used. And when we are fully developed and all of our faculties are in use, and um, we understand what we are doing. We, we, we feel we are conscious of our own existence. This produces something that Rousseau very importantly calls the sentiment of one's existence. And uh, we will come back to that. I will just say at the moment, it's um, a very important concept in Rousseau. And without the education of the senses, it can't happen. So Rousseau imagines an automaton, a fully grown being um, who would have the sentiment of his own existence, but could do nothing else. I mean, that you could imagine such a being. He also imagines how the world looks from the point of view of an oyster and says for an oyster, because there is no progressive or forward movement, all of the universe comes down to a single point so that it is necessary for us to walk, to grasp, to measure, to compare. In order, we have to, we have to move in the world in the way in which a child, of course, lo loves to do. We have to do all of those things 
um, before we can begin to use our mind to estimate them. This is still an education that um, is negative in the sense that Rousseau is not so much interested in what you know uh, as he is interested in preserving the heart from vice and the mind from error. So going back to the root, going back to the beginning, these are the things we need to know first. Um, and in the end, when he is looking at the mature child of Emile, Emile at 11 or 12, what he admires about him is, is his ability to judge. He is judicious. Um, he has, well, one of the things that Emile can do, and this is this will become clear why this is important in a moment, but Emile can, by just being told to imagine a cake, a little cake, uh, a French pastry on a stone uh, that uh, the tutor points out to him. He has an eye as sure as a surveyor's chain so that he can judge distances. He knows his own strength. He doesn't try to do things beyond his ability, um, but he also, he knows how to make his way in the world as a consequence of this early training. Um, there is of course no obedience. You cannot speak to the child about his duties, although it will turn out that you can talk to him about his rights and you um, never command him anything. Um, since this is the realm of natural freedom, it is like the state of nature in, in one sense, but the challenges are very, very carefully calibrated again so that they are almost imperceptibly made more vigorous. Um, this is what Rousseau calls the appropriate history of the species. Um, there of course are big differences. I mean, Rousseau using his language uh, says there's nothing so sharp so uh, accurate, so alert as a savage, and nothing so dull as a peasant. Because the savage must foresee the circumstance, uh, the consequences of everything he is going to do before he takes a step forward into the world. Um, the peasant is accustomed to working and working hard but only at the orders or on the behest of another. His life is routine. Neither the peasant nor the savage is thinking about developing his soul, but the one is exercising his faculties in such a way that mind and body work together. And that is the goal. But of course, if you think about how natural man is described in the discourse on the origin of inequality, um, Rousseau, you can understand very easily the stakes are quite different. Um, for the man in the state of nature, the stakes could not be higher. It, it's mostly a matter of life and death, whether he is interspersed among other animals, many of whom are predators. He has to decide, is this one that I could fight or should I flee? He has to make these constant decisions based on comparing his strength with the things that are out there. And um, so from that standpoint, uh, there, there, there are a few risks in this part of the education. Teaching the child to swim, for example, may have some risk associated with it, but it's not life or death. Uh, there's a little spoiled child who gets corrected um, by Rousseau with the permission of the father in book two, um, who wants to go out for a walk and, uh, or no, sorry, Rousseau asked him to go out for a walk and the little boy said, no. So the next day, the little boy who is testing the tutor, uh, Rousseau, uh, actually the real Rousseau asks to go out for a walk and Rousseau says no. So the little boy who is very accustomed to being obeyed by his parents, certainly his mother and, uh, 
apparently Rousseau talked to his father and they arranged a little scene. And so the little boy says, I'm gonna go out by myself, thank you. And so um, Rousseau says, fine, goodbye, <laughs> see you later. And once the little boy gets out there, of course, there's a whole uh, scenario set up with actors uh, playing the parts, you know, trying, to, talking about the dangers that this little boy is about to encounter and how nobody knows him here and they're not gonna take special notice of him. And eventually he does come home um, with his tail between his legs and the father rather sharply says, you know, it's fine for you to go out by yourself, but I would prefer that no bandits live in my house. And consequently, if this happens again, I'm afraid the door will be locked. So, um, I mean, that's a, that's a severe measure that is taken, but um, it was a severe instance or a, a, an extreme instance. So, um, Let's see, if we can't use punishment, if we can't berate the child, if we can't scold the child, um, if we can't engage in a tug of wills with the child, which all of us have in one way or another experienced, what hook do we have to get the child to believe that it's doing what it wants when in fact it's doing what we want? How can we, what is the hook? And according to Rousseau, and again, this goes along nicely with things that John Locke has said in his book on education, we can use immediate and palpable interest. Anything that is not of immediate and palpable interest to the child, they will not remember. We don't sermonize, give them maxims. We don't give them teachable moments. We don't try to hasten them into learning little moral, mor <laughs> moral morsels from fables because there's not supposed to be any poetry. There's no catechism. There's no Bible stories for children either. I mean, when we think about the ant and the grasshopper, it seems like a harmless little story. But when Rousseau takes up uh, the wonderful book of fables by La Fontaine, which all French children are supposed to read, um, he, uh, he doesn't want to use it. And he deconstructs one of the fables called The Fox and the Crow um, and makes us under, <laughs> it's actually quite funny. Um, he does a little something like what Socrates does in The Republic uh, when he says, I don't want any imitative poetry for our imaginary guardian's education, uh, just narrated stories. And so he takes um, a beautiful piece of poetry from Homer and puts it in a narrative form. And of course that takes all of the beauty away from it. But in The Fox and the Crow, just very briefly in the deconstruction, I mean, Rousseau starts out by saying, um, on a, a crow on a tree perched. Well, nobody says that. It's perched on a tree. So why do we have to have this extra um, icing in terms of what's going on? And secondly, the, in its beak, the crow held a cheese. And Rousseau's question is, what kind of cheese? Was it a Swiss cheese? Was it a brie? Was it a Gouda? You know, what kind of cheese? And he does this throughout the entire, even though the lesson is supposed to be good um, because the fox who is tempted by seeing the crow with the cheese flatters the crow. Beautiful crow, what lovely feathers, how handsome you are. My goodness, if you had a voice to match your incredibly beautiful plumage, you could become the king of the forest, I mean, the phoenix of the forest. And so susceptible to this flattery, the dupe crow opens its mouth and the cheese falls out and the fox catches it and then gives a little lesson. According to Rousseau, the children would rather have the cheese 
<laughs> than the lesson. And furthermore, nobody is going to, I mean, once you realize what's happening, you're not going to want to be the crow. You're going to want to be the fox and cause other people to drop their cheeses. So he, he goes through this and says, uh, you know, no, nothing imitative, nothing of the sort, nothing uh, glamorized or dramatized. And um, therefore, we should recognize that students really, children really can reason quite well in everything that relates to their immediate and palpable interest. And the motive therefore to be used, the particular hook to be used at this age is, Rousseau says, gluttony. Um, I was gonna give you a, an example that I, I has always stayed with me. And uh, a dear friend <laughs> went shopping a number of years ago, number of years ago with her five-year-old daughter and they were picking out dresses and they're in the dressing room and they've got the dresses down to two. And my friend said to her five-year-old, you may take your choice, either this one, you may have your choice, either this one or this one. And the little girl said, if I had my choice, I'd get them both. So children know how to reason, oftentimes stumping the parents. And that's, that's an issue. So gluttony is the motive. You can use this. And Rousseau said you shouldn't be worried about whether or not this will be a motive for them when they grow up. Once they become adolescents, gluttony or food is not the first thing that's going to be on their mind. And so supposing you want to teach a child how to read, you must put something before him that he wants or that he considers useful, something suitable to his age and faculties. One of the things Locke does when teaching reading is um, to use dice. And Rousseau uh, affects to be offended by the notion of using something from gambling. But then he says not, it's not even necessary. I mean, Locke also says, if you want to teach children to read, Tell them it's something only grown-ups can do. Um, Rousseau says, I've got something better. A meal is not so solitary and isolated that he doesn't encounter other children. And he gets notes or letters, invitations from people for outings or to go fishing or whatever it is. And sometimes someone is there to help him read it and or to read it for him. But other times that person can't be found and he's stuck. And so after a couple of times when he's missed out on something that he would really want to do, again, he's he is developing a desire to learn how to read so as not to miss out on a party. And so for example, he gets an invitation that has something to do with eating a custard, a creme brulee on the next day or so. And Emil can do a little bit of the reading, but he util utilizes all of his faculties, all of his resources to try to decipher the note. And according to Rousseau, this is fine. We can only know the use of our organs by employing them and um, this, is a, this is a very good thing for a meal to be able to do, and you needn't worry about him getting bad habits from him. But go th it's not a motive, as I said, that would work for older ages, but it's one that would work, that works now. Okay, so um, I'm not, a, I, uh, Rousseau, there are some wonderful little episodes in book two, and I wanted to mention two of them. Uh, one of them has to do with, um, they both have to do with the senses and gluttony and um, learning to 
learning to appeal to the child in terms of the reason, the way in which a reason can chi a, re a child can reason. So Rousseau says, instead of teaching duties to children, why doesn't anybody ever consider teaching them their rights? Because our first, our first um, responsibilities are to ourselves. And so on pages eight and nine, a 98 and 99, um, Rousseau talks about um, and presents to us a garden. This garden is very different from the Garden of Eden as presented in scripture. And, um, and it's also a rather delightful little story about how since they're living in a rural village near farms, a meal sees people working on the farms. And encouraged by the tutor, Emil would like to imitate the farmers that he sees, and he would like to have a garden. And so they find a plot of land, and with the help of the tutor, who, who probably plows the plot of land, they plant a bean. Emil plants a bean in the land. And um, it is important, Rousseau says, for him to learn a little bit about property and things that belong to you, um, even though you don't go very far in those things. Now, Rousseau has said in the second discourse also that the first person to say this is mine with respect to a piece of land, uh, the first person to claim property rights is the true founder of civil society. So there is a way in which he is learning something which is going to have a big implication for him later on. So anyway, they, they plant the beans, they watch the plants sprout and grow, they go to water them every day, and then they go one time to water the plants and discover that the plants have been completely ripped out. Um, Rousseau has already said in the manner of a true Lockean philosopher, that if you've labored on something, if you've put yourself, which you own, into something and the work of your hands and your sweat is in it, it's yours. Which seems to suggest you could go anywhere and just begin plowing, but that's sort of what they did. They, they, made, they made a garden and then they go back, hoping to water the plants and look forward to the green beans uh, growing up growing, um, they, um, they discover that someone has ripped up all of the plants. Horror, <laughs> Rousseau says as tutor, that Emil is devastated and that he cries vigorously, he moans, he aches, he throws himself on the ground and he's angry. Who took my beans? You know, these were mine. Who took them away? They find out that the person who did it is the gardener, Robert, who is summoned uh, to, to them. And Robert, it turns out, is not abashed. He's not ashamed. He's not humiliated. He's angry because in that same plot of ground, he had planted Maltese melons a very exquisite and rare kind of melon. I mean, just imagine a cantaloupe or, you know, a honeydew melon, something delightful, something rather more delightful than beans, as a matter of fact. And so once they, they had this conversation in which Emil, still sniffing from uh, his tears, asks whether beans are often lost or melon seeds are often lost. And the angry gardener, you know, mocking his giddiness says, well, no, they're not because people stay away from your, you know, your garden and they, they don't interfere with your garden so that you won't interfere with their garden. And Emil says, I don't have a garden. You know, and the gardener tells him, well, the fact is there's not much fallow land. There's not much open space or common space uh, out there anymore. It's mostly been occupied. 
So then the tutor suggests that perhaps the gardener could give them a plot, a little portion of his land and on the condition that a meal will give him half of the produce of the beans and they can exchange beans for melons. So the gardener who is somewhat appeased by all of this says, fine, if you stay away from my melons, I'll stay away from your beans and gives him without condition a portion of the land that he and his father before him have cultivated. So we can see how gluttony works here. Oh, and they also promised to give him new melon seeds. So the prospect of being regaled by tasty melons is still there for Emil. Um, one of the things that isn't mentioned, but of course, I'm sure you can conceive, we are on the estate, but maybe even the country estate of Emil's parents. And Emil is in fact the landlord over this uh, land, uh, or his parents are, and someday he will be. And, and Robert is merely an employee of the family and probably has to give half of his crop to the family. You know, he has, he has to share the melons whether he wants to or not. So um, labor being the true title uh, to property. I think that that is important for the future uh, of Emil and also the fact that, um, that the fact that Robert is, you know, perhaps something different than he might appear to be from the example because Rousseau does not stop to tell us all of this other, uh, he doesn't add much obiter dicta to the, the presentation, but um, you can get the idea. Um, and there is another, uh, down the road, there is another um, example or episode. I'm gonna skip over a couple things and just say that um, this is, it begins on page 141 of uh, the Bloom edition. And this also, I think, helps to answer the question which was raised after in our first class about whether children are competitive or cooperative, because this is an instance of real competitiveness. Um, Rousseau writes that there was a lazy or indolent child, a child of noble birth who didn't think he had to do anything didn't think he had to learn anything, thought that his noble, his rank in society, his high position in society would spare him from having to do any of those things. Um, and um, about 10 pages later in the Emile, uh, Rousseau admits that the child that is being spoken of here, he doesn't tell us this up front, but at the end, he tells us the child being spoken of here is in fact a meal. So a lazy and indolent a meal, potentially spoiled, not necessarily an athlete. How are you gonna get this child to exercise? Well, the way in which uh, it is done, um, as you may in fact remember, is by means of gluttony again. Um, they go for a walk and uh, the tutor always brings uh, two cakes, one for himself and one for a meal. Sometimes he brings a third cake or one time he brings a third cake and Emil wants it because he could have polished off six or seven of the cakes, they're not huge. Um, and the tutor says, well, you know, I could give it to you or I could eat it myself, but I think it would be fun to watch these little boys race for it and I will give it to the one who is the winner. And so several times with increasing numbers of spectators, little boys are running for cake um, on courses that Rousseau has designed. And these courses um, are 
well, the first time it's a very simple course. It's very short. And um, a Neil had gotten irritated seeing all the cakes being given to the winners of this race. So he starts practicing running in secret. And then when he gets really good, he says he'd like a go. And uh, Rousseau made sure to keep the best racer away that day. And Emil wins the cake. And this turns out to be a passion of Emil's running. And there is a certain point at which um, the tutor uh, designs a courses because there are more contenders now and more cakes and he has to control them all. And he finally has to tell to his face and because Emil didn't quite get it that he was cheating on Emil's behalf because he was designing a course for which Emil could take in order to have the shortest route to the cake. Um, and <laughs> the tutor says to him, I didn't tell you to run. I didn't ask you to run. You chose to run. If you want the cake, just pick the shortest route. So this requires the exercise of judgment and estimation on uh, Emil's part so that he can figure out uh, and he can't use, he can't pace out the courses, the, the course. He can't do what he might do if it were just a small, uh, a small length of time, a uh, small length. Um, and what Rousseau, when he admits that it is a meal that he's been talking about, um, he says that a meal views the cake not as a prize for running well, but he only knows that the sole means of getting the cake is to get there before somebody else. So his focus is on the cake. His focus is not on winning a prize. And um, so there is a lot of competition there, but it's not the sort of competition that would instill vanity. Uh, that would instill what Rousseau calls amour propre, a kind of a sense of pride that you are better than somebody else that becomes as sweet a victory as a French pastry because a meal is controllable by means of his desire for the sweets. And when it becomes possible for, or when it becomes likely that a meal will in fact begin to look upon um, the prize as superior to the cake, um, he is not allowed to compete with others. He's only allowed to compete with himself, saying that this is what, where, how far you could run and at how, what, what pace when you were this age and now look at you, or this is the drawing you made when you were four but now look at you, you're 13, see the difference. Um, and there's another reason for all of this and it runs throughout the entirety of Emil, but it is present even at this early age. The relationship between uh, the tutor and the pupil is extremely important and it's a little bit fragile. The child must always be as transparent as possible to the tutor. But the tutor is in a way opaque to the child. He's not supposed to awaken curiosity about himself when he's working with the child. Um, the tutor doesn't even compete in running, not that he could win all the time anyway. Um, but you don't wanna give the child some reason for scrutinizing the tutor too carefully. You don't want the child to begin to consider the tutor's motives, the governor's motives or his misdeeds. And you certainly don't wanna give the child any reason in the world to lie. The, the child must be completely naive and candid uh, with the tutor who of course never punishes him. So you never give the child a reason to lie. I mean, Rousseau takes up the question of the Garden of Eden in this section as well and says, if you are told not to do something and you do it anyway, and then you're caught, somebody is gonna say to you, did you do that? 
And you're going to say, no, I didn't. And you're going to try to hide like Adam and Eve. And consequently, you know, something is going to happen to you. But Rousseau says, whatever punishment there is must always be seen to come from the thing itself. Like if the child breaks windows three days in a row, you may have to put him in a timeout in a room without windows because those windows are, are mine and I can't have them broken. And then you can, you know, put things back on a, on a, a balanced footing. But you never, never want to get in a tug of wills between the tutor and the child. It will never be over when you have to dispute who is going to be, uh, who is going to be the winners, who is going to be the winner. And so it seems as if Rousseau is, if I may say so, offering a criticism of the procedure in the Garden of Eden. You want the punishment to appear to come from the order of things, not as Rousseau puts it, from the vengeance of the governor. You don't want the child ever to even imagine that the tutor could have ill will or could be um, you know, vulnerable on that score. Um, again, because the tutor must study the child, the tutor must essentially get the child to do what the tutor wants the child to do. And the only way that's going to happen is if the child perceives nothing but benevolence coming from the tutor, as if he doesn't even see that he is subject to a human will uh, or even a divine will. He's not supposed to be subject to any wills. He's supposed to be subject to things and things alone. And so this relationship between the tutor and the child, um, it comes up in every chapter and is extremely important. And I think that um, with this picture of this picture that Rousseau seems to love so much of natural freedom, I will stop and we'll go on to book three next time. But we might have time for questions. We do, and we have a couple of questions that were a bit similar, but I'll read them separately since they were distinct enough, uh, both relating to the question of property rights. The yes. first question, with the Gardner anecdote and Rousseau's belief in property rights as the bedrock of civil society, does that mean that Emile's entry into society becomes a result of the Gardner's odd generosity? <laughs> um, well, Rousseau tells us in the preface, oh, uh, sorry, I think, we're, uh, wait a minute, let me start over. Um, the gardener's generosity allows Emile to think that the only inequalities that matter at all are the inequalities of age and strength. And he's not supposed to know about the gardener's rather low position in the ranks of society. So the gardener's generosity is important and it's okay for a meal to defer to that generosity. Um, and it does suggest, the fact that Rousseau had said that in the second discourse does suggest that a meal who we're thinking of as being sort of in this semi state of nature is in fact moving even at this age toward the exi his existence within an actual civil society. I don't think it depends ultimately on the gardener's generosity. It's going to depend on, uh, as for Locke, on the fact that we begin free. And if we put ourselves under law, it can only be because it's a law that we made. And um, and it doesn't really depend on generosity, I don't think. But I do, I like that point about the gardeners being generous very much. Yeah. And the other question that had a, a similar topic, it seems that the concept of a property right is naturally cultivated in the child in the garden episode, which would suggest that property rights come to be in each human. 
In the second discourse, property rights come to be in the human species as a result of historical developments. Is there a tension here? The idea of natural coming to be in a meal and the coming to be of property rights over time in the species? Um, well, I think it's helpful to think of a meal as a representative sample of the species that uh, that Rousseau is attempting to show us what ought to have been the history of the species, what ought to have been the order of development of our organs and of our faculties, if, let's say, a godlike individual had been in charge, but no one was in charge. And um, I mean, there are some things uh, overcoming natural obstacles that are inevitable um, for the sake of preservation. And so a meal as the tutor or Rousseau calls him an ordinary mind and he is meant, but he's had an extraordinary education. So we get to see how far can you take a person via education into the realm of exceptionality. Um, the property, I mean, I'm not, would it, would it necessarily have occurred to eight or nine year old Emil that he does own things, um, that that there is such a thing as property rights? I mean, I think so. I, I, um, I mean, I remember my grandson when his two uh, siblings were born, um, declaring that a certain part of the living room was his and his alone. And his parents kept saying, use your words. <laughs> Do not try to expel them by force. And I told him to say 911 <laughs> as, a, as a sort of call to them, whether good or ill. And uh, so the first time they violated his patch, um, he screamed out, 911, 911. So I think, yes, property could occur to Emil. Um, the unfolding of property rights, I think that the second question has to do with that, the evolution of property rights. Is it different in the individual and in the species? And I'm not sure that it is, although. I'm, I'm not sure that Rousseau intends it to be presented as if it were different, as if, but I'll have to think about that some more. And thank you for the excellent question. Sorry that I, I'm not as articulate as I should be about it, but yes, I'll think again. Okay, and our last question for this evening, someone asked, I was wondering if Montessori studied ideas of Rousseau, Locke and her ideas theories on learning. I don't know. I mean, I've mentioned John Dewey, who definitely was influenced by books two and three, and uh, definitely book three in terms of experiential learning. And I think that the Montessori, Montessori idea, all of our ideas of education seem to have been affected by our putting the child in the center and trying to consider what the child what childhood itself might demand. I mean, at one point in book two, Rousseau says, childhood is reason's sleep. And you shouldn't try, you know, again, to um, rush the child's growth. This is a period of time which is meant to be idle, to let the child ripen and to do, I mean, I think in a Montessori school, might you be, might it be possible for you to do things you want when you want them, or am I thinking of another another type of school? But yes, I mean, I think our views of education are more student-centered, children-centered, but um, I don't know, I mean, most educators would disregard, you're gonna teach the child to hear, you're gonna teach the child to see, you know, I mean, that part, which Rousseau treats as so fundamental and basic and important is, could be oftentimes neglected by educators. Um, and again, it corresponds to a particular stage of history, a particular stage of the species. This is the era 
of natural freedom. And so what is there is designed to preserve that freedom as much as possible and to let the child enjoy it um, and to be able to recall it at the level of reason once, you know, once that takes place. Terrific. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining us this evening. We thank look forward to seeing you in subsequent weeks. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.